Hey everyone, just wanted to give you all a quick disclaimer. There will be no information from the DLC in this video, and it is all going to be about the main game. So none of the newer theories that are going to be coming up in the upcoming days and weeks are included in this. This is very much for those who wanted to keep themselves away from the DLC and just want to know the basics of what has gone on up until now in the main game. Also, this whole video was a Twitch stream. So if you want to catch more streams of me doing these types of things, I stream at twitch.tv slash rodskaden. But yeah, having said all of that, I hope you enjoy the video. Welcome to Elden Ring Lore for Dummies. This will be a presentation of the important things that you may need to know, actually that you'll probably need to know for the DLC. If you're jumping onto Elden Ring now and you're like, what in the world? You're like that little cat going, I made this presentation for me primarily. So I made it because I'm a dummy. If you identify yourself as a dummy as well, good for you. Cause this, this is how I was able to understand everything that was going on. Remember there will be a test after this, which will be worth 80% uh, of your grades. Be aware of that. I think the first question, you're a fresh player to Elden Ring is where, where does it take place? Can anyone in class tell me? Ohio, cool. that's part of the map. That's part of it. The lands between, hey, that's right. Yeah, the lands between, that's the name of the land. What is it between? Uh, we might find out at some point tomorrow. The lands between, and it's beautiful and great. And it's ruled by a, a, a queen. Her name is, is Marika. And she she rules the land until the Elden Ring broke. Uh oh, titular Elden Ring. And, and, and everyone was sad. Because the Elden Ring broke, Marika got stuck in the earth tree. But she called help from people from another land. Oh, that's you! And that's it. That's it. Thank you. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much for stopping by. That's gonna be that's gonna be the presentation for tonight. I'm gonna take it slower. So we have here the lands between. This is where it takes place. It has many trees and a real big one right in the middle. The Ur tree. And for many, many years, it gave life to all and healed anyone who had any ailments. At the base of the Ur tree was the capital. It was called Langdell, and it was the golden city. Who was it ruled by? Merica, yes! It was by Queen Merica. She wasn't just a ruler. She wasn't just a queen. She was made a god. Now you may be asking yourself, who made her a god? It was something called the Greater Will. It's an outer god. If you're familiar with Eldritch lore, things like Bloodborne, where you have the old gods, and it's all these gods that are very unknowable, inconceivable, too big for human minds to comprehend. That's kind of the idea of outer gods. And there's multiple of them. But here's the thing, none of these outer gods can interact with the world, so they need a vessel. And who is the Greater Will's vessel? Queen Marika. Each of the outer gods, they want something, they yearn for something. And in the case of the Greater Will, it's order. It yearns for order. So first we have to go back to a long time before Marika, before she was born, before anything happened, long before the Ur Tree even existed where everything was together. Everything was one in a primordial soup type thing that was called the Crucible. And if there was something that the greater will didn't like, it was the Crucible. Cause it was messy. It didn't have any rules and it didn't have anything defined. Everything was just together and <laughs> So the greater will was like, I'm gonna try to fix this mess of a place that just doesn't have anything. I'm gonna send a comet with some order in it. And inside this comet was our friend, the Elden Beast, which is the physical manifestation of order. And it's also the representative of the greater will in the lands between, because the greater will cannot come to the lands between, cannot be manifested in the lands between, so it uses the Elden Beast. So it has Merica as a vessel for itself to enforce those rules and the Elden Beast to make sure those rules exist in the first place in the lands between. The Elden Beast is creating the rules because the Elden Beast is the Elden Ring. And the Elden Ring is the laws of the world. What it did right at the beginning when it was all the crucible, it starts separating and organizing things. So things weren't all just jumbled together anymore. They start separating into races and things. It's laws of nature like cause and effect and life and death. 
And with life and death, this was a bit of a problem for America specifically. America didn't like the idea of death, especially for herself. So what did she do? The moment she ascended to godhood, she decided to make death not a thing. And this rune that you're seeing on the screen is called the rune of death or destined death. So you can kind of understand what kind of death wasn't possible anymore, because you can still die if you get killed and stuff like that. But your natural death, the, the death that you were supposed to have, you could no longer have that. Demigods, gods would live forever. People also would live a really long time unless they got killed somehow. So America gave everyone immortality, essentially. So you can imagine as if death, no longer a law of nature, no longer something that has to happen. It can happen if you get killed by like someone or, or something, but naturally, you're not gonna die. And this is really cool. Imagine all the rich people just living forever, doing all the things they do. It would be just like the nobles in the game. You know, look, look at how great he looks. Look at how nice. Look at how nice he is. Look at, look at. Mwah. Mwah. Look, uh, that's so nice. For abolishing death, she's now called America the Eternal. The thing is, she still controlled death. She got that rune of death. She didn't just throw it away. She actually gave it to her shadow, which is also known as a shadow bound beast. America's shadow is Malekith. Is, is this, this, this good boy. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, look at him, look at him. Oh, I love him, I love the little guy. I love Malekith, Malekith is great. So he is the best boy. So Malekith's like, hey Malekith, can you keep the rune of death for me? And Malekith's like, woo, 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 woo. and he keeps the rune of death. And from that point on, because he's keeping the rune of death, he's known as Malekith the Black Blade, because guess where he put the rune of death? He, 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 put, he put in his black blade, he, he put it. <laughs> He, 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 he put in the, in the black blade, that, that's it. Now that Destined Death, though, was no longer in the Elden Ring, Merica decided to start a new philosophical and theological movement, so essentially a religion, called the Golden Order. With the remaining runes of the Elden Ring, there were two fundamental rules. The first one is the... Why is it moving automatically? Okay, I'll just wing it. The first one is the law of causality, which means that things have a cause and effect. Okay, okay, this thing is gonna keep wanting to, to do. And then you also have the law of regression, which means that everything yearns to return to its original state, to being one, converging. Then you can think, if everything came together, isn't that kind of like the crucible, which America's against, the Golden Order is against? And you're right, they're just rejecting reality and being like, no, regression means Means going back to the earth tree. We're going back to the earth tree because that's, that's what matters. And America wanted everyone to follow it, independent of where they lived, independent of what they believed. So you can guess, someone comes in trying to force a belief system on you. You're probably not gonna be very happy. Get out of here, Horaloo. So she was like, if people, if, if people, Horaloo, if people are not gonna wanna believe in the Golden Order, we gotta make them believe in the Golden Order or else they die. But you know, America, not really a fighter. So she needed someone at, at Horalu, it's almost your turn. So she needed someone that can fight all of the factions, all of the peoples that stood against the Golden Order and the Earth Tree because they just believed their own things. And that person was... Horalu! He did it, y'all. Horalu was picked because he was a bloodthirsty warrior, had lived in the Badlands. He's the chieftain of the Badlands. He's crazy. He's good. He's powerful. So he would become Queen America's king consort. He become the Elden Lord. So yes, technically speaking, you're agreeing to marry Merica in the game if you become Elden Lord. You wouldn't really think of him as king material though. So to make him proper, instead of like taking time, you know, teaching him how to do things, you know, eat with a fork and a knife and you go from the outside in with, with your forks and knives, they were just like, nah. Put a beast on his back as if it's like the ultimate anti-hype man. Dude literally has a beast being like, no, 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 you gotta chill. Or is like, oh, food. No, 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 here, you, you gotta, you gotta use your, your hands to, to use a fork and a knife. When Sarosh, which is the name of the beast, joined him, he then became, Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. There he is with his anti-hype man, Sarosh. Uh, a lot of people, actually, as I was looking for pictures, the amount of thirsty pictures <laughs> I found. Uh, we, we don't need to talk about. When Merica made him Elden Lord, his first assignment was to end the one thing that could destroy the Erd Tree, and that was the fire giants. The, the fire giants lived in, in ice cold mountains, I guess, to 
level out their hotness. The fire giants had a flame that could burn through the Earth Tree. So they had to be solid. They had to be the first thing they did. Godfrey led the fight against the giants and eventually they would not only kill the giants, but kill the God that the giants believed in. They left one giant alive to take care of the fire that could burn the earth tree to be like, don't let anyone use it. If you let someone use it, uh, I don't know what we're gonna do. We don't wanna kill you because you need to stop the next person. Don't, don't do it. The fire giants are destroyed. Nothing can destroy the Erd Tree. New era begins in history, the era of the Erd Tree. And during this era, America and Godfrey had three known children. The first one. Godwin the Golden! He was the perfect boy. He, he, he's so amazing. He's so amazing, everyone. We love him. Everybody loves him. He, he's the best. Why is it not working? Oh, yes. Oh, look at him. Look at him go. Look, look at how beautiful this man is. Oh, not too far. Nothing bad will ever befall Godwin. No, Godwin is cool. Everybody loves Godwin. And he's hot. Nothing bad ever happens to hot people. Have you ever noticed that? It's incredible. It's incredible. Life is, life is easy. <laughs> But there were two other kids, and they were very unlike Godwin the Golden, and they were known as the Cursed Omen Twins. Because we're gonna talk now about omens. What are omens? Omens are children that are born with horns all over their body, all over their faces. They don't receive any grace. The earth tree just shuns them, and they're considered impure. The reason why, why they're considered impure is because of all the horns. What the horns are a characteristic of is the crucible. So in reality, this curse not really a curse, just nature trying to be nature. But the Golden Order is like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. not very orderly. So next up, the actual cursed Omen Twins. We have Morgoth, who did not like his curse, did not lean into it. He wanted nothing to do with it. They were put in the sewers. They grew up in the sewers. And he was like, I, I don't want any of this. Get me out of here. I love the Golden Order. I know the Golden Order hates me. I know the Earth Tree hates me. I love the Earth Tree. The Earth Tree? Pretty, beautiful, I love it. But then you have someone that's the opposite. His twin brother, Moog, is like, no, 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 I love my curse, I love cursing, oh. So he loves his cursed blood and he revels in that. So they're very much the opposites. Next, we have America's campaigns, which she continues to go through using Godfrey and her champions to conquer all the other peoples and all the other groups. Small groups like the ancient eternal dragons, we don't care about them. The Stormlord, which is really cool. If you've ever seen the castle of Stormvale very early on in the game, the Stormlord was a bird. Imagine just being a big bird. And finally, the last major group was Lyernia. America was declaring war on Lyernia because they didn't want to believe in the beliefs of the Golden Order. In Lyernia, there were two major factions that ruled. There were the Carrion Royals. They were astrologers. They used the stars and the moon to determine their fates, and they also used them to create different spells, different types of magics. You also had the Academy of Rey Lucaria, which was also a magic-based group, but they used Glintstone, a type of stone that you could find and mine, and they used those as a focus and as a way to power their magics. At this point, they had united to fight against the Golden Order. To fight these two, which were very powerful and very magic-based, America sent someone new, a champion of hers. It wasn't Godfrey, but she sent Radagon. He's also hot. He's another big old hot guy. He's got flowing red hair. He's good at fighting. He's hot. It was perfect. But I guess he wasn't that good, though. They go to war twice with, with Lyernia. And they don't really win? They don't lose, but they don't win either time. But in the middle of fighting the second Lyernian War, the two commanders of the two armies clashed. They met. The leader of Rey Lucaria and the Carrion royal family was none other than Renala, who was the Lunar Queen. She was a Carrion noble that then joined the Academy of Rey Lucaria and inspired them with her astral moon powers. And they were like, yo, you should join us. Together, they, they joined forces under her. Yeah, they were fighting and then they were like, yo, you kind of hot. And then the other guy was like, you kind of hot. You you fight bare chested like that? That's kind of cool. And he's like, oh, you know how to fly? That's kind of, that's kind of, I like that. So then they stop fighting and they get married. And I like to believe that turtle pope Muriel is the one who married them. And they had three beautiful children. 
First off, probably the biggest giga chat in the game, Radon. He was a great warrior. He was just super powerful. And then because he was the son of Renala, also learned some magic. But the interesting reason is why he learned magic. He learned a specific type of magic called gravitational magic, gravity magic, for one reason. Because he wanted to be able to continue to ride his horse without hurting his horse. He had a scrawny horse. He knew the horse wouldn't be able to continue to hold him. So he learned gravity magic to lift his weight off of his horse so that he could continue to ride his horse. This horse's name is Leonard. Look at this little guy. He's so weak. Uh, he's so frail. But Radon loved him. And you know what? I respect that. And remember, here's the thing. You want to know why all the animals look kind of terrible in the game? Like you look at the merchants. Nothing can die. They age but they do not die. Starvation cannot kill you. Anyway, the next son was Rikard. Rikard doesn't care about anyone. He just wanted to do his own thing. So he moved to a volcano and gets eaten by a snake. Next up, we have Lunar Princess Ronnie, and she takes after her mother, and she was pretty sick. She was pretty cool. She was pretty cool. And they lived happily ever after. This is classic George R.R. R. Martin moment. They all lived happily ever after, and everything was fine and dandy with, with this family of beautiful redheads. Is that Blade? Yeah, it is. Or Blythe? I, I said his name right. Uh, anyway, uh, so everything is happy now with this family. E everything is going great. Everything is going dandy. So we gotta we gotta get back to America because America is not doing so well. America. Uh she started having a mid-religion crisis. She's having this religion crisis about the Golden Order despite literally having the Elden Ring inside of her. And she's like, uh, maybe, maybe this thing too good. Starts questioning the Golden Order. And she starts calling herself Doubton Merica. Absolutely canon. Absolutely canon. She calls herself Doubton Merica from now on. Because she be Doubton. So what happens? Godfrey gets caught in Downton America's crossfire. So after Godfrey defeats the last enemy America had told him to defeat, Downton America comes in like, uh, I think you're not gonna have grace anymore now. You're not you're not gonna have grace and you're now a tarnished. Tarnished being someone who lost the grace. And she did that not only to him, but to all of his warriors and all of his descendants. So Downton America was like, yeah, Godfrey, get out of here. And you know, you're my husband. Yeah. So that's what she did. She just kicked him out and was like, you're tarnished now. You don't have grace. You can die. That's the big thing. Without grace, you could just die. And when this happens, when, when she starts doubting everything, a lot of bad stuff starts to happen. You remember happily ever after? I lied. There is no happily ever after. The moment Godfrey leaves, Radagon leaves Renala, goes back to Lindell, marries Merica. So now Radagon becomes second Elden Lord. Radagon just abandons Renala and leaves her with an egg. He's like, yo, Renala, I'm leaving. I'm gonna go marry uh, America, the queen, the god of the land, and I'm gonna leave you with Egg. This is genuinely one of the saddest parts. She genuinely loved Radagon. She loved that guy. So she's so depressed now that she hugs the Egg the rest of her life. And all she can think about is this stupid Egg. Her heart is destroyed by Radagon. On a brighter side though, her children, now technically demigods, because they are now the stepchildren to America. So they inherit that. Couldn't she just get a cat? Here's the thing. It's this is like John Wick where the egg is the dog and that's the last thing she has of Radagon But yeah, Renala never recovers. She just says egg now. Radagon and America get busy. Uh, Radagon and America have children. They pop out two kids at once. That's called having twins. These twins are, are known as the twin prodigies. The first one was Melania and the second one was Akila. The weirdest thing happened. I really don't know why. They were both born with terrible afflictions. Horrible. I don't know why. No idea. The first twin, Melania, she had a curse of a growing rot inside of her that was expanding and consuming her body and making her limbs fall off. That's why she has a robotic arm and robotic leg. Well, not robotic, but like prosthetic. And the second one, Mikula, was cursed with having eternal youth. Dude has eternal youth, looks like, looks like kid forever. But yeah, so now we have a period of all of the kids growing up, except for Mikula. Mikula can't grow up. So everyone else grows up though. But then someone goes through a phase and gets a little bit gothy. So then we have goth Ronnie. And goth Ronnie, she's like, hey, I like death. And then she goes over to Maliketh, who's the cutest little pupper. Oh yeah. Look at him, he doesn't know how to drink the Wawa. Yeah, so she, she goes there and she, she gives him a little scritches and he's like moving his little like, 
You know, he's just he's just a little guy. He's just a little dude. And while he's like thumping his foot because she's scritching him, she steals a piece of the rune of death. You know, she just yoinks it. And Malakath goes, Roo. and Ronnie makes uh, some knives with the pieces of the rune of death. Gives them to the black knife assassins. Kind of weird name. They're her goth groupies. So she made black knives, gave it to the black knife assassins, and nothing happened. Once again, George R. R. Martin didn't finish writing this story. Just kidding! It's the Night of the Black Knife! Ooh. You wanna know what happens? They kill Godwin! You know, the Golden Boy! The one everyone loved! Even uh, Mikkel and Melania loved him! Everybody loved him! Uh, I loved him! You know, he had a cool back! Look what he, they did to his back now! Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Look at what they did. So he becomes the first demigod to die. And then Ronnie's like, my goth groupies, carve the same sick rune you carved on Godwin on my back. So they carve the same rune and she dies. In fact, Ronnie and Godwin die at the exact same time. No one's gonna suspect Ronnie because she dead and she died at the same time. But here, here's the trick though. This wasn't just clean deaths. Boom, they're dead. Turns out Godwin's body continued living, powered by the rune of death. The body was now being used by the rune of death to spread death. And he slowly deformed into what you see here and was called the Prince of Death. So the reason why this happened is because he never had a proper burial. When you died, you were supposed to be put at the foot of the herb tree so that the herb tree could absorb your soul. He wasn't, his soul just beep, and it's gone, but the body survived. Ronnie, on the other hand, planned all of this, so she had a doll ready. Like, mm, yo groupies, put me in the doll when you kill me. Get the doll there so my souls can go into the doll. I wanna be in the doll. Not in a weird way, but I wanna become the doll. The doll is now my vessel. And they were like, okay, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. Uh, and and she made some, uh, some cool modifications, you know? Like, she gave herself four arms. Like, if you could pick, why wouldn't you pick having four arms, I'm just saying. So it worked out for her. Rods, what? This is what happened in the Night of the Black Knives. Now, you would think, that at this point, Doubting Merica would be about to blow up. She literally just had her golden son be killed. She had her stepdaughter die, and she's still having her weird mid-religion crisis. You would think she would blow and explode and, and just go crazy. You would think so, but she does. She does, she snaps. She doesn't just snap herself. She decides to snap the Elden Ring. She's like, this is stupid. The Golden Order is stupid. Nothing that I did works. She's self down She's like, oh, I, I pulled the Rune of Death. Why? Why did I do this? This is all stupid. Order is stupid. I'm gonna burn it. I'm gonna burn it. Well, I'm not gonna burn it. I'm gonna break it. So she tries to break it. And she does break it. She doesn't just try it. She breaks it, shatters the Elden Ring. Radagon would try to fix it, but it was already in so many pieces. It had been scattered to the wind. It was all over the land. This tiny little pieces, which you collect as a currency from killing things and stuff like that. Here's the thing, right? Because everyone was trying to grab all, all these runes, an event called the Shattering. With the Elden Ring runes all over the place. It wasn't just normal people going after them. It was also the demigods and their factions, as well as others, that started running for them and trying to grab them, fighting amongst them. And at the same time, the Elden Beast imprisons Merica, crucifying her inside of the Earth Tree. Here's a cool little detail. Merica was the vessel for the Elden Ring. The Elden Beast is the Elden Ring. They both start to shatter as well. The Elden Beast has a, has a big old gash, probably because of the shattering of the Elden Ring. So then, Merica still had a plan. Merica was like, hey, we should get Godfrey back here. We should get Godfrey and like all his descendants and warriors. Eh, they should come back. Cause like, it's a mess here now. Uh, Godfrey, can you can you come back and uh, take down all these like sacrilegious demigods and become Elden Lord, you know? You can, you can marry me, whatever. That's kind of cool, right? You want to marry me. So she calls back all of the tarnished, all of their descendants, try to fix all the uh, the things that were going on. And that, it's you! There we go, everyone. You asked me to explain a little bit better, so now I went into a little bit more detail. Now we all get it. But yeah, there we go. Wait a minute. There's something I failed to tell you all. You know Radagon? You know Merica? Radagon is Merica! Do you understand? Radagon is Merica! Is America not likes not is America? They're they're the same person. Radagon is America. Radagon is America. America could split herself 
Do you understand? Remember, remember, remember when she became Doubt in America? That was when Radagon split from her. Why? Because Radagon was a part of her that liked order, that liked the Golden Order too, because that's order. And what happened is that now she didn't. She she started doubting. She started doubting because she didn't have Radagon in her. That's why she started doubting. They began as one, and a part of herself left. She's not a full person when Radagon is not with her. Thank you. But also, do you, do you guys remember Melania and Mikola? Remember that they were born with ailments, with illnesses, with curses? Now I ask you, incest is bad. I don't ask you that. Actually, I tell you, incest is bad. What if you had a, a child with yourself? I would say that's even worse. self cest worse than incest confirmed? Question mark, exclamation mark. So, America, have you ever thought about that, America? Have you ever thought that maybe that's why your children were getting sick? Have you ever thought of that, America? Uh, I sure have. Uh, uh. I'm just saying, I don't say this, this seems, this seems kind of obvious to me. This seems kind of obvious to me. This is a complete theory. I wonder if this is an ability of the Newman. America's race is Newman and they're never explored too much, but they're from another realm. We need to actually talk about two people because there is a shadow of the earth tree coming out. Actually already came out. We need to talk about Mikula and Moog because at least one of them is turning out to be very important for the DLC. I think it's worth knowing this if you're jumping into the DLC. So let's talk about Mikula a little bit more. So again, He's one of the twin prodigies. He was born afflicted with eternal youth. And Mikula is the other child of Merica that is absolutely beloved by everyone. He's just a very charismatic person. He's incredibly smart, incredibly wise, incredibly kind as well. He's described to be very, very kind. Descriptions of items and stuff always describe him as always being able to gain people's favor, always being able to convince people, always being able to get what he want eventually. But again, in the early times of his life, his dad, Radagon, was teaching him about Golden Order fundamentalism, which Radagon, again, loves order, loves the Golden Order very much about that. Mikela would even go and make some incantations within, I guess, Golden Order fundamentalism. But then he would turn his back on fundamentalism because the one thing that he cared about deeply was his sister. He wanted to see her well, and she was slowly dying because of a growing rot inside of her. So after studying, he realized that the Golden Order could not save Melania. So he abandoned it because there was no hope there to help her. So he starts to look for solutions elsewhere. And then he discovers unalloyed gold, pure gold. The pure gold turned out to be able to stop the progression of Melania's rot. Not only that, unalloyed gold, turns out, it could prevent any other god from interfering going boogly boogly boo. Because it turns out that the rot growing in Melania was an outer god. The god of rot was growing inside of her. She was the vessel for the god of rot. But as Mikkel continued to research, he started a new place, the Halig Tree. It's very well hidden and in very rough terrain. And for it to grow, Mikkel uses his own blood. Mikola waters it with his own blood from a sapling. At the same time, he also welcomes in all of the people who were shunned by the Golden Order. Most of these are, are creatures that show aspects of the Crucible, and these include the Misbegotten, the Crystallians, and the Kindred of Rot, which uh, came through because of Melania. Every group that was unwanted by the rest of society were welcomed in the Halig Tree. But yeah, so good old kind and smart Mikela was something completely different at night. Not literal night, but he was the kind and smart Saint Trina. For those who don't know, in the game, Saint Trina's items, they are the items that make you sleep. They make you fall asleep, that you, you can inflict sleep on enemies. And in the description of items and things, they are described as looking like a young girl or a young boy. Very androgynous, very David Bowie-like. Uh, no one knew who or what she was. But to everyone that she appeared to, Saint Trina was beloved. But at the same time, one part that no one talks about is that, you know, with the pots and the arrows and the things that you can put, Saint Trina could have possibly been weaponizing sleep to control people, but uh, Mikula's cool. Just as quick as Mikula donned the cape of Saint Trina, she disappeared, never to be seen again. But what about Moog? I hear you all asking, what about Moog? I want to know about Moog. Well, I'm going to tell you about Moog. Moog had some uh, quirky tendencies, we'll call them. He's just a little... <laughs> 
He's just a little quirky. So he embraced his cursed blood and he may have gone a little bit too far, you know, getting a little bit too quirky. When you find Mikula in the game, he's not in the Halig tree. Mikula put himself at the heart of the Halig tree, the tree that he grew with his blood, inside of a cocoon because he hoped to be reborn. But while he was doing that, while he was in his little cocoon, Mo came in and uh, just kidnapped, just stole Mikula away. But why? Why, why was Mo being so <clears throat> quirky? Was he just trying to copy Bowser? Just like kidnapping Mikula? trying to marry Mikula. Actually, true. Uh, he was. He was straight up just doing the Bowser. Wanted to marry Mikula. But here's the issue, right? I feel like maybe maybe someone should have told Moak that Mikula is a child forever. <laughs> Or maybe someone did tell him and that made Mikula even more interesting to him. Like I said, he absolutely embraced the cursed side of his blood. So Moog took Mikula to, to his palace. Mogwin Palace, Mogwin Palace? I don't know. The fact that he embraced his accursed blood caught the attention of a certain outer god called the Formless Mother. She was also called the Mother of Truth. Why is she the Mother of Truth? Don't ask me. And she loves when wounds are created on people. She loves creating wounds on herself. So much so that if you're a follower of the Formless Mother, how it works is that you'll open a little, you'll open a little portal in the sky and then with your weapon or with your hand, you literally poke her and blood starts gushing out and then you throw that blood on people. Because it's accursed blood, much like Moog's, it combusts and catches on fire. So that's the Formless Mother. So with the power of the Formless Mother, which gave his blood this power to hurt and inflict damage, Moog wants to start a dynasty, but he can't be a god. He cannot be, truly be the vessel for the Formless Mother. Why? Because he's impure, he's cursed. So he needs someone to become a god, and that someone is Mikula. So Moog wants to use Mikula to become a god, then he marries Mikula and becomes the Elden Lord for the Formless Mother. Here's the most interesting part of this. All of this might have been according to Mikula's plan. As odd as that may sound, this may be what Mikula wanted. I mean, say like, how? That sounds horrible. Why would, why would Mikula want that? So Mikula has been always trying to find answers to help people, to cure Melania. And there's a place that has held many answers that Merica sealed away and he cannot get there as long as he has two things, his physical body and his grace. He needed to be divested of his grace. And a way to do that is using cursed blood, cursed omen blood, put that in people and on people to remove all grace and all possibility of them returning to the earth tree. Through having Moog put a cursed blood on him and in him, he would no longer have any grace. His grace would have been taken away. Moog, throughout this whole time that he had Mikula here, was telling all of his followers to make blood sacrifices to Mikula. Everyone was doing blood sacrifices to Mikula. Moog was like with Mikula in the cocoon all the time. Now granted, at this point though, Mikula is probably dead. Because again, Mikula needs to die. The body needs to die for Mikula to be able to go to this other place. So Moog might just be doing nothing to anything that's living. So he successfully removed Mikula's grace and successfully killed Mikula. And in this way, Mikula is free to go. He is now free to go to the Land of Shadows. Many of you will know. And what is Mikula doing there? What does Mikula want? <laughs> There's only one way to find out. There's only one way to play the game, play the DLC. Thank you for the money, Miyazaki. Yeah, this was all a ploy to get people interested in playing the game. Yeah. Now everybody's gonna play the game, play the game, buy the game. It's cool. It's better than any other game you're gonna find out there. They're not gonna put microtransactions. It is good. Now everybody, everybody go play it.